Jesus name we pray. So how many here are excited? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Worship was amazing, was it? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Girl, it's on you, honey. So awesome. Worship was amazing. Um, as you guys all know, you guys came to see a mighty man of God, Apostle uh, Tony Kemp, our guest here, and I'm going to hand over the mic to him. He's an amazing man, and you guys are for are in for an amazing word of God, and um, come on, tell me, Apostle Tony Kemp, please welcome him. Stand up, let's honor the man of God. All right, I'm going to give the mic to him now. So anyway, well, who are you? Great. Maybe somebody said, let them be light. Let them be light. Like. Okay, so here's what I'd like to do. Much better. It's all right with you. No, it's too much. It's, um, it's okay for you, Pastor. I, turn, I can turn on the light. Turn off. Is it too bright? Or no, too this bright? is great. Oh, nice. Perfect. Yeah. If you'll give me some more bass, too. And, and, uh, yeah, just see if you can get that time. Uh, Well, um, I want to do this as informally as possible. Is that all right with you? Yes. Yes. And, uh, this is an informal. Good, 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 good. Try to get my phone out. 
and uh, super, super. Testing one, two. I think that's better. Does that work? Is that better for you? Yeah. Okay, then we've got the problem solved. Okay, uh, let me start with this. Um, this is a statement I, I like to make. And it's, um, if it's not practical, it's not spiritual. So, if it is practical, it is spiritual. And so, I want to start um, just, just talking. Is that all right? Yes. And then, uh, so I have 7.53. So, Lisette, remember yeah. that I started at 7.53. Yes. <laughs> you know, because I can go on and on and on. Okay. Um, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 11, this is what God says. He said, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. And I have led you in right paths. And so, I want to begin this discussion in terms of uh, looking at this subject called wisdom. So, um, let me give you a couple of other scriptures as we're um, pursuing this truth. Um, I think the, you know, and I can probably, you know, I might want to stay. I think I'll go ahead and, and uh, sort of start from the book of Proverbs, sort of. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. And um, I'll start with verse 1. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father. Give attention. Hear um, and give attention. Uh, in the Hebrew, okay, in, in English, we have two separate words. We have hear and we have obey. But in the Hebrew, they're one word. So to hear is when you obey, and when you obey, you hear. So it's not two separate words. Give attention to no understanding. So we have knowledge and understanding. If I give you good doctrine, do not forsake my law or my Torah or my teaching or my instruction. Okay? Uh, when I was my father's son and tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, my father taught me. He said, let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. And then here's verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake wisdom. Wisdom will preserve you. Love wisdom. Wisdom will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get an understanding. By the way, the Hebrew word for wisdom is in the feminine. Okay? So exalt her, exalt wisdom, and she, wisdom, will promote you. She, wisdom, will bring you to honor when you embrace her. Wisdom will place an, on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. Wisdom she will deliver to you. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. For I've taught you in the way of wisdom. I've led you in right paths. Okay? So now, let's start with wisdom. And if you're taking notes, here's the first thing I want you to write down. In order for you to receive new wisdom from God, you need a problem that you cannot solve. Mm. That's good. Whether that's a personal problem, a marital problem, a problem with a child, a career or financial problem, a church problem, ministry problem. You need a problem you cannot solve on your own. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, 
you need to have limited resources in order to solve the problem or no resources whatsoever to address the problem. People tell me I go too fast, so I'm pausing. Number three, when you are wrestling with the problem, you must be willing to fail at first when you try to solve it. I know that there are people who are afraid of failure. But failure is something that you need because it will help you with your humility. Number two, failure is something you need because after the Lord Jesus gives you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and the problem is solved, it encourages people to know that you failed first and succeeded second because it gives other people hope. That means that failure is on the road to my success. Okay. Now, number four. You need a creative idea. A creative idea. Now, in connection with this, when you're looking at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews, the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, I think I will have you turn there. Because I do want you to actually, and sometimes it's good just to see it. Isaiah chapter 11. Starting with verse 1, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. This is a reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus as the Christ and as the Messiah. And a branch shall uh, grow out of his roots, out of that family line. And it says concerning the Lord Jesus, look what it says here. Number one, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon Jesus. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might. Spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, which is very interesting because it talks about in Revelation 4 the seven spirits of God that are before the throne. Okay. But here's where I'm going. The word here for wisdom is creativity. That means that creativity and wisdom are related. Now, when you look at children, children seem to maintain their creativity until they go to kindergarten or first grade. And then the spirit of this age does everything it can to get them to conform to be like everyone else. And in the process of that, most children lose their creativity. The research is that by the time a child becomes an adult, only 2% of the adults retain creativity. So, when it comes to problem solving, the issue is one of wisdom and creativity. But it's very easy to reach a false conclusion that you are not creative. But in Christ Jesus, I dare say you are creative 
Because in Genesis 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis, it says that God says, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if any person is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are dead and passed away. All things have become new. And so that means that you're in Christ. You are in creativity. Because Christ is a creator. And it also means that creativity is in you. So there is creative space in you. Jesus the creator, because in the beginning was the word, John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, no God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So that means that creativity is in you. Creativity is in your spirit. So, the one of the keys to progress and moving forward in life, growth and expansion, is for you to tap into the creativity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so, a problem you cannot solve, limited or no resources, a willingness to failure at first, and tapping into a creative idea that comes from God. Okay. Usually these persons are called dreamers. Look at somebody and ask them a question. Are you a dreamer? Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. The enemy, over time, wants to steal your God-given dream. Your, your dream is the eye of hope. Hope, by definition, biblically, is to have a positive expectation of the future based upon the revelation of the word. Amen. But the enemy... Say that again, say that again. Yes, sir, I will. <laughs> oh, no, no, I like you. Because <laughs> this is, remember I said it's informal? Informal. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. See, I'm, see, I'm black. <laughs> We're talking, sir. <laughs> We're talking, we're talking to movies, we're talking to church, we just be talking. <laughs> and so listen to me. Listen to me. Feel free to interrupt me and say, hey, can you say that again? Because the whole point of this is for you to get it. Amen. So I will say it again. What it is is this. The dream is the eye of the future. And hope is the future. For example, you know the scripture. Um, Jeremiah 29, 29, 11 says, I have come to give you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. And an expected end. I'm come to do you good, not to harm you. Mm -hmm. But see, revelation, the spirit of wisdom and creativity, is the eye of hope for your future. See, do you know what people are wrestling with? Let me tell you. Um, people are wrestling with a sense of hopelessness. Okay. Um, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Hey, L.A. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you something. Were you around when I talked about falling into the prophetic? This morning? Yeah. Did I have that conversation with you? Okay. Let me have it with you now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, the prophetic is something you can fall into. And um, let me just do an aside. Uh, one of the things I mentioned this morning at Pastor Tony's church was this, um, that, that 
Acts 2, 15, 16, and following, said, it will come to pass in the last day, it says, now that I have brought my spirit upon all flesh. And it says, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Everybody say visions. Visions. Dreams. Dreams. Okay. It's the result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Visions, dreams, revelations are a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 29, 18 says where there's no vision, Hebrew, there's no revelation, no prophecy, people perish. They throw off self-restraint. Because you restrain yourself in the present to step into your future. So I mentioned that Ephesians 1, 11 says that Christ should obtain an inheritance. So visions and dreams of the future are part of your inheritance. You don't have to be a prophet to be a visionary or to be a dreamer. Okay? And so, one of the things that's happening, and when I talk about falling into the prophetic, uh, one of the things I had shared this morning is that um, you don't seek revelation. You seek the face of God. And we, okay, let me just, well, I'm going to, okay, all of this is so tied together, it's, it's difficult for me sometimes. Uh, what we do, see, what we do is, this is what we do. We consider the presence and the glory as the same thing. But biblically, scripturally, and linguistically, they're not. The presence in Hebrew is called the panim. This is being face to face with God. Okay? There are seven different words in the Hebrew for glory. Amen. Seven. Okay? So what happens is, is when you seek the Lord, you seek his presence, you seek his face. You seek to know who and what he is. Okay? So when you do that, if you seek revelation, Revelation eludes you. If you seek his face and his presence, get to know him intimately, then revelation comes to you and wisdom comes to you. That's why the prophet said, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying. Stay with me? Everybody say dreamers. Dreamers. Everybody say, everybody say creative idea. Yes. Now this is also related to Ephesians 1 to 17 where he says the God of glory, notice the God of glory, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in your intimate knowledge of the Father. Amen. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Well, depending upon what Greek text you read, Understanding can be translated the eyes of your heart, or it could be or we get the word cardio, or it could be translated eyes of your understanding, or we get the word dianoia in the Greek. Either way, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, photiza, which means flooded with light, which means you're seeing something you didn't see before. Look at somebody say creative problem solving. You just need one creative idea. Okay? That's where it all starts. So, without that creative idea, you will, and I'm being prophetic, you will feel stuck. You will feel stuck in your spiritual life. You'll feel stuck mentally, you'll feel stuck emotionally, you'll feel stuck financially. You will feel stuck. You can look at me like you're looking at me, but trust me. <laughs> I'm talking to some people right here, right now. Amen. In one way or another, you feel stuck. Talking to me. Well, raise your hand if I'm talking to you. Raise your hand. Now, Remember LA when I talked about 
falling into the prophetic? Yes. Which I was just talking yes. about. Right? So yes. you short term okay? <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's the deal with people. When people think of the supernatural, they typically look for something that's really spectacular. And there is the spectacular. Like this morning, the woman who had been deaf for 43 years in her ear, yeah. right? Instantly she hears. And, you know, and that's, that's wonderful. That's great. Praise the Lord. Thank God for that. I really do thank God for that. But the supernatural is not always spectacular. Sometimes it's like Sid Roth says, welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. And so... The supernatural can be just a creative idea that enables you to solve a problem. Amen. That you couldn't solve before. Now, here's the problem. Okay. All right. So, here's what I'm doing. When you get frustrated, when, when, when you feel stuck, over time, you feel frustrated. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then you get mad. <laughs> we try, Pastor. Yes. <laughs> yes. No being mad. <laughs> okay. Walk, walk in the positive way, and all that. Then you get mad. <laughs> <laughs> And then you begin to have conversation that goes like this. What is going on? Yeah, and then the next one is, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> and then you can feel uncertain. And then you feel confused because you don't know what to do. But it all started with you getting stuck. And so you need an idea. And so this is why I'm speaking to this, because here's what people do. And I get it. We put the supernatural of God in church when you need it for your everyday life. You need, you need the creativity of Jesus Christ for every day. Okay, you know, a uh, physician solves medical problems, a mechanic solves mechanical problems, an attorney solves legal problems. Hopefully, at least you hope that they do, <laughs> you give them the money. <laughs> so, this whole thing of creativity. Now, creativity is an insight. It's the ability to see into the thing. Creativity, by the way, in the Greek, is the Greek word Sophia. Again, it's, it's feminine both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. Amen. But creativity also has to do with a skill set. Now, let me tell you what happens. If you don't get unstuck, you drop off. You read the word less. Pray less, you fellowship with the God's people less, you start dropping off. The Hebrew writer addresses this. He says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. They're dropping off. Then later on in Hebrews, you can turn to chapter 10. Because he says it in 1025, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Everybody say, stuck, stuck. stuck. drop off. Drop and off. then if you don't catch yourself, then you drop out. So verse 37, well, actually, verse 38, chapter 10, Hebrews. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We are not of those who draw back to destruction, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. Everybody say, stuck. Stuck. 
drop off, drop off, drop out, drop out, or progress. Progress. Okay, so now turn to the book of Philippians. And what I want to say to you is by faith and by wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, you progress. So in Philippians 1, this is what he says, verse 25. He says, and being confident of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you all for your, everybody say progress, progress. and joy of faith. So um, you could progress. Look at somebody say, but you need some wisdom. Now, here's what's going on. In Hebrews 11, it says the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The word understanding there, the best way for me to describe it in English is it's knowing how to put the pieces of the puzzle together. We're still talking about problem solving. It's knowing how things fit together. Okay? We're talking about your life. We're talking about your ministry. We're talking about your future. And in the Greek, you can also see that, that this whole thing of understanding has to do with knowing how things flow Okay. And so here's here's what's going on. And th this will see, here's what a lot of people are thinking. They're thinking if I just have enough faith, things will work out. That's what they're thinking. If I have enough faith, I'll see something miraculous. Not realizing that wisdom and faith partner together for the miraculous. Turn to Mark chapter 5. Matthew, Mark. Starting with verse 1. Then Jesus went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. And this is what they said. Where did this man get these things? What wisdom is this that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Everybody say, wisdom. Wisdom. And the miraculous. And the miraculous. Go together. Okay? So this is what you're looking at. Everybody say wisdom. Wisdom. And faith. And faith. Go together. To manifest the miraculous. To manifest the miraculous. Yes, sir. So you say what the word says in James. Wisdom is the working, or wisdom relates to the working together with faith. So glad you brought that up. <laughs> because if we go to James 1, let's and see what we see. Chapter 1, James. By the way, this was the half brother of Jesus. History says that the brothers of Jesus didn't believe that he was the son of God. They didn't believe in his ministry. And of all of his brothers, James, Joses, Jude, and Simon, James is the one who fought Jesus the most. In fact, if you go back and you read the record, after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, one of the persons that he appeared to you know, was James. I mean, I could take you through and show you that 
and then James gets converted. And then James chapter 1 verse 1 says, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Bondservant is doulos. It's, one, it's a person who's given up uh, all rights to himself. His will is swallowed up in the will of his master. To the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, greetings. My brothers, count it all joy, not if you fall into different temptations or various trials, but when you fall into trials. Look at somebody say, sooner or later, you're going to fall into some trials. Knowing this, the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, what we say is this. We say, you tested my patience. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit says the testing of your faith produces patience. Then it says, but let patience have its, um, let patience have its full effect that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing, which means prior to the problem you couldn't solve, there was something that you were lacking. Prior to the trial, prior to the trouble, prior to the difficulty, there was something that you were lacking. Now, God Almighty could have prevented it, but in his wisdom, he permits it. Because he uses the trial, the trouble, the problem to get something to you that he couldn't get to you any other way. So when you have a problem, here's your question. Who and what do you want to be to me now that unless this problem was here, you could not have, not have been that to me before? Who and what do you want to be to me now that you could not have been to me that's what he's saying. He said that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing, which means prior to that, there's something you're lacking. Well, then how do I get what's lacking? He says, as any of you lacks what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Remember I said, you got to have a problem that challenges you that you can't solve. And this one, you know, you really got a problem. Your mama can't solve <laughs> when your mama can't solve it, you in trouble. You really need the Lord God Almighty. When your education won't solve it, when your when your when your money won't solve it, when your community won't solve it, when your nation won't solve it, look at somebody say, you, "Now you really need Jesus." And typically, you'll try to solve it on your own, because that's usually what we do. Even as believers in Jesus, we try to fix it. And then we fail, and then we go into anxiety. Instead of <laughs> instead of <laughs> asking for some wisdom, <laughs> look at somebody smile and say, "You really do need some wisdom." <laughs> now look at him and smile and say, "I've been wanting to tell you that for a real long time." <laughs> So, so there relate. See, see, here's it. See, see, here's what we. Here, here's what faith wants to do. Faith wants to leap. Wisdom wants to look first. <laughs> faith wants to take a risk. Wisdom wants to take a calculated risk. <laughs> Right? Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> faith wants to throw caution to the wind. Wisdom wants to do research. <laughs> so that, so that when you land, you get the desired results. This is why wisdom, wisdom and faith go together. In fact, just to make the point, uh, turn to First Corinthians chapter twelve. That's that Corinthians. I'm going to get that Corinthians. I'm going to get First Corinthians. That's your own story. I'm trying to find my way.
12 and 10, we call this miracles. But in the Greek, it's called, everybody say, the work of the miracles. So work of the miracles. Which means you got to know how to work it. Well, how are you going to work it? Look at somebody say, you need some wisdom. You need some wisdom. So where did Jesus get this wisdom from that these mighty works are done by his hands? We go all the way back here as Isaiah 11, and it says, the spirit of the Lord is on Jesus, the spirit of wisdom and creativity, the spirit of understanding how things fit and flow together. And then it says something very interesting. The spirit of counsel, which is on the mind and the heart of God. And then it says the spirit of might. But might, or the miraculous, follows wisdom understanding and counsel. This will make you think. If you stay in Isaiah and you go to chapter 9 and you read concerning Jesus, Isaiah's prophecy, he'll say, Jesus is the mighty God. He'll say, he's the Prince of Peace. He will say, he's the everlasting Father. And that's English, but in Hebrew, means Jesus is the father of eternity. And then it says this, he's a wonderful counselor. But in the Hebrew it translates brilliant strategist. Okay, here's my whole point. Jesus is a brilliant strategist and he lives in you. You have to tap into the Lord Jesus and get his brilliant strategy to solve the problem either for your benefit or the benefit of others. But it's usually in the form of a creative idea. To prove this to you, turn to uh, 1 Timothy. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This command I commit, or this charge I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on you, that by them you may war or wage a good warfare, having faith a good conscience. But you want to know what this thing it means in the Greek, waging a good warfare? Yes. It means to find the right strategy. The enemy is overcome mm. by God's brilliant strategy that you get the revelation of that you decide to walk in each and every day. Strategy. It's an idea. The fifth step is this having the courage to act. Courage being faith. Creative idea. By the way, creativity has to do with thinking something new. Innovation has to do with doing something new. Now, I, I like to say this because um, Henry Ford said, thinking is the hardest thing a man will ever do, and then he went on to say, that's why so few people do it. No, we just believe what we're told. It comes across CNN and we believe it. It comes across Fox, we believe it. It comes across one of the networks, we just believe it. Really? No, they're telling you a narrative. They're just trying to shape your mind. When one of the CIA directors says historically, we will know that our disinformation campaign against the American people as workers when everything they believe is false. Okay. So now my anti
anti government? The answer is no, but I know that in addition to what the government you see, there's a secret government that tells the government you see what to do. I will leave that one back there. <laughs> well, that's how John F. Kennedy got killed. He actually thought he was in charge. <laughs> no, we, um, you know, this, this is a side of life we don't really want to, we don't really want to deal with that. We don't, we, we don't want to face that there are really women yeah. very, very. who do not have our best interest in heart. And a lot of us are still thinking that we follow the Constitution of the United States. And we don't. So I know you may want to believe that. But it switched over to the uh, to the corporation of the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you come to Congress or the House, you act in the best interest of the corporation, right. not the best interest of the people. And so, anyway, Amen. this is why you better you better get to know Jesus. Come on, Harry. Come on. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me say this. No, 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 because this is important. So I grew up with a guy who went into politics. Uh, he ended up being like a state representative. So he gets, he's, he knows the Lord, he's a preacher, he's an angelist. And he goes down there, he, this, somebody gives him a word of wisdom. Says, listen, uh, go to the, you know, to the meetings. But if, if, if they invite you, even if the vice president invites you to his house, don't go. And this is what he's told. He said, because you'll drink something, you'll wake up in a hotel with a picture right here you doing something with somebody and now they own you. That's what he was told. Amen. Okay. So I have a prophet that I know. So this woman, he meets this woman and he tells her, he says, uh, you're going to be on Air Force One with President Clinton. She looks at him and says, you crazy. So he prophesizes her. And uh, <laughs> she gets a phone call that Clinton wanted her on Air Force One. And she thought somebody was telling a joke. So she didn't even take it seriously. Found out it was true. She ends up on Air Force One. So, so at some point, the prophet says, um, you're going to get an invitation to go to such and such an island. Don't go because they're setting you up. He says that. Then her doorbell, somebody knocks on the doorbell and the doorbell rings, but before she can get to the door, her phone rings. And the prophet's on the phone and says, um, the FBI is at your front door. <laughs> and um, they're gonna tap your phone. And um, I'm gonna tell you when it's tapped. I'm gonna tell you when it's not tapped. When you go to the front door, you're going to find out the FBI is there. Say this. So she goes to the front door. Guess who's there? FBI. FBI. Right? Okay. So she did get invited, and she didn't go. Okay? Now, this prophet friend of mine, he's funny. He's, he's, uh, he lives in Miami. And so sometimes when he has, he gets real revelatory. So he says to this pastor, this ain't funny, but I'm laughing anyway. <laughs> he says to this pastor, he says, your assistant is stealing money from you. And, and the pastor then won't believe it. So the, what this prophet does is he says, um, he says, uh, I'm going to write out these numbers and these letters right here. These numbers, these letters, in this order. What I want you to do is go and ask him for a dollar bill. If the numbers of these letters are in this order, he's stealing from you. 
So he goes through the assistant pastor and says, oh, this guy's a false prophet. He says, you're stealing from me. I don't believe it. Oh, boy, you got a dollar? Pulls out a dollar. Pulls out the paper. The exact wow. sequence wow. of the numbers and the letters. And yeah, he was stealing. <laughs> So what am I saying? I'm saying the spirit of the Lord, that spirit of knowledge, wisdom, and revelation, mm -hmm. solved the pastor's problem. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm saying that that woman was saved from being set up. She was an attorney. She was a politician. She was saved from being set up by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. By the spirit of wisdom and revelation, she actually did end up on Air Force One with President Clinton. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. It helped her make decisions with regards to her future. Okay? The spirit of wisdom and revelation saves her from trouble. Yes. Look at somebody say, Do you need to be saved from any trouble? Yes. That's why we, we have to go together. <laughs> so, and so this this whole spirit of wisdom and revelation is is to help you and to help others. Okay, and so um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to mention it to you because um, a lot of times what we're doing is we're, we're taking this whole thing and we're making it woo woo. Look at somebody say, let's get rid of the woo. -woo. Let's get rid of the woo, -woo. Okay? And let's let's um, let's 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 bring heaven to earth. Because what did Jesus do? Jesus, when he was on earth, he solved other people's problems. That's what he did. Look look at me. You are called to solve other people's problems. And when you solve other people's problems, you get rewarded by God. You can get rewarded by God in the hereafter, or you can get rewarded by God in the here and now. Okay, questions? Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's one tip that you could give that as far as I'm doing this for Facebook. What is one tip you could give as far as? Getting more intimate with the Lord, closer, closer intimate relationship. Yeah, here's the, here's the thing. And the question is, is what tip would I give to uh, increase intimacy with God? Um, I talk about, um, look, okay, let me say it to you like this. Even if you were a um, professional basketball player, you played in the NBA, um, you always go back to your foundations. So you're going to always do drills of passing. You're always going to do drills of, of uh, free throw shooting. You're always going to do, uh, uh, you're going to do dribbling. Um, you're, all, you're, going to, you're going to get in condition. You're going to play defense. You're, you're, just, just, you're always going to go back to the fundamentals, OK? And, um, you know, I played football and basketball when I was young, and we played football. We had two practices a day in the heat in August, you know, early morning and in the afternoon, and, you know, you, you have to get in condition. I used to hate to run when the coach made us. Now, if I was running on my own, that was a different story. <laughs> but, you know, if I ran long distance on my own, I'm doing it, but, you know, just to make me run. Run, run. I hate to run it because it was boring. So here's what I would say. Um, you feed your spirit with the word of God, and that in and of itself, as you think the word, speak the word, and do the word, will take you into the realm of the spirit and new realms in the spirit. In Joshua 1 and 8, my word which you have in writing must govern everything you say. Meditate in my word day and night. And then see to it or observe that you do all that's written, and you will make your way to prosper. In the Hebrew, means have a good journey in the will of God. And you'll have good success. The word meditate in the Hebrew means to have an idea 
and to be in orbit around it. It means to think about something in the Word of God again and again and again. You think about it until it takes on mass and substance, and then it begins to multiply, and then it begins to manifest. And so what happens with a lot of people is they don't meditate in the Word of God until it gets to the point where it creates mass or substance. Now faith is the substance, the Word of faith which we preach. So once it takes on substance or mass, then it gets bigger, and then it moves from addition. James said in the second letter, he said, add to your faith virtue. So it takes on addition, and then it multiplies. Wow. Okay, And then when it multiplies, then it, it gets to a point where it has so much mass that it manifests. It manifests in your spirit first. It manifests first in the invisible, and then it becomes visible. Okay, And so this is all through the process of meditation. This is why um, Psalms, Psalms 1 says, Blessed are the man does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, he doesn't sit in the seat of the proud, doesn't, um, doesn't um, sit, walk, doesn't stand in the way of the ungodly. So sit, walk, stand, but his delight is in the law, the Torah, the word, the instruction of the Lord, and in that Torah, in that word, he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water. His leaf will not wither, whatever he does shall what? Prosper. So um, what, one of the things that we have lost is the memorization of scripture. You know, we have lost meditating in scripture. So we just, we have, listen to me, we have substituted prayer for meditation. That's right. Now you're supposed to put meditation with prayer. And so, um, you know, scripture says Isaiah went out in the evening to meditate. David said, I will meditate. And so this whole thing of meditation, of being in orbit, you know, being, uh, taking a, a God thought and just, just rolling it around in your head until it becomes, that revelation becomes a reality. So I would say feed your spirit the word of God. The basics, and I, I say this because Paul told Timothy, he said, give yourself to the reading of the scriptures. Jesus says, search the scriptures, but he says that in John, he needs to compare one scripture with another. So you're looking at a topical study, but that's faith, hope, love. A Turkological study, whether that be Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or David, or Paul, or whoever. To actually study a book. Um, and then, and then Paul told Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God. And so what will happen is, as you, as you study the word and put application to the word, because James said, be ye doers of the word, James 1.22. Here's the crazy thing. Would you know, would, would you believe it? The Greek word do is the word poetis, which means creativity. When you hear the word, you're supposed to be thinking of creative ways to put that word into practice. It's, it's still the same concept. With regards to ministry, once you discover your calling and your gifting, your anointing and your ministry, you have to feed your gift. You have to feed your calling, you have to feed your, your gifting, you have to feed your anointing, you have to feed your ministry. You have to feed it. Your destiny has a diet. Your destiny has a diet. You are what you eat. So, um, so you have to have a well-balanced spiritual diet. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. So, there is this place where you have to feed your calling. So if you have the calling of a pastor, you want to study books on pastor. You eat the meat, you spit out the bones. If you want to enter to the ministry of healing, you study the ministry of healing from the scriptures, but then you study healing evangelists. You learn what works, what doesn't work. You've got to feed your gift. If you want to be a teacher, you study principles of teaching. Okay. Um, if you want to be a preacher, 
you know, you need to know something about how to preach. Your introduction, your body, points one through five, your conclusion, your summary. Are you speaking to entertain, to inform, to persuade? What are you doing? And if it's the kind of message, you do all three. So, um, so that's, that's what I would say. So it starts with the word, okay? Because all scripture is given by that breath of God. Um, the second thing, I, uh, and I'm big, I'm huge on this. Um, in Luke 4.16, it says, And Jesus, as it was his custom, went into the synagogue for to read. But, but custom is a habit. Look at somebody say, it's a habit. It's a, habit. a habit is something that you do regularly and frequently. You don't do it just when you feel like it. You don't do it when you're in the mood. It's something you do regularly and frequently. It's, 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 a, um, it's something you do. It's a practice established by repetition. And see, here's what I teach. Your habits break you or your habits make you. Look at somebody say, your habits, your habits. break you break or they make you. And so what it is is this. Your habits will keep you from the realm of the spirit or your habits will take you into the realm of the spirit. Okay, example. The scripture says in Mark, Jesus rose up a great while before the day, departed to a solitary place, and there prayed. Mark 135. The disciples never asked Jesus how to preach. They never asked Jesus how to work miracles. They asked Jesus how to pray. So the Bible says Jesus is in a certain place during the day and he's praying. And then it says that Jesus would finish ministering to the people and would depart from the people and go pray. And then it says Jesus would sometimes pray all night, Luke 6. So Jesus had a custom and established a habit uh, by repetition of prayer. So, so much so that the book of Acts chapter 6 verse chapter six, verse 4 says, that the, the apostles said, we will give ourselves continually to the prayer. Then you have Daniel, who the Bible says prayed three times a day. So your habits, okay. Your habits, okay. You are the sum total of your habits. In fact, the habits that you have formed today determine the stories you tell tomorrow. And so, here's what it is. Success does not come by what you do occasionally. It comes by what you do in your daily routine. Successful people in any endeavor of life do consistently what other people do occasionally. And so it's, it's um, and that's just the beginning of this discussion on habits. <clears throat> just the beginning. And so what it is, is, is um, with regards to that, people focus on the what, but not the how. And then they wonder why they fail. The how is the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding. Okay, look. Your life does not rise to the level of your goals. Your life rises to the level of your systems. Goals don't create success. Systems create success. Even in your first Corinthians chapter 12, it says there's diversities of gifts, that's Holy Spirit, diversities of service, that's the Lord Jesus, but diversities of operations, the same God. So God works by systems. So you need to find the wisdom system that God has chosen for you that fits the success he's wanting to put you in. Amen. 
is by systems. Yes, ma'am. One more time. Can you repeat that? Now? Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Your life will not rise to the level of your ambitions or your goals. Your life rises to the level of your systems. And so what it is is this. People fail either from a wrong system or a lack of a lack of a system. See, this is what, okay. I work by systems. I work by systems. I just have to find the system that will produce that area of the supernatural in Jesus Christ. Because it's all my systems. The issue is, is we generally don't know the system. Okay? See, I could say stuff that will make you go, hmm. You'll say, how did that happen? Well, that person knew the system. Ready? Now I'm going to really start to mess with you. Look at somebody said, now he's going to really mess with you. Oh, no. Really mess with you. Right? I'm going to really mess with you. Okay, you ready? What if I said to you that when Joseph was in prison, the way he got out of prison was he pushed his gift into the atmosphere? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. That can't be my fault. Grab it for me. I had it on me. Pushed his gift. What was his gift? His gift was to dream and to interpret the dream. So when he pushes out his gift, because you could push your gift into the atmosphere. The butler and the baker has a dream. Okay, let me say it to you in a way. I'll never forget this. When I was in high school, there was a guy. We were in the hallway, and this guy walked by. And all around him, you could feel this depression. It just like, it was like surrounded him. Well, the, the spirit of depression was in him, but after a while, it began to overshadow him. And literally, as he walked by, bam, the spirit of depression, I felt it as he would just walk past, right? Just like you can feel somebody's anger. It gets in the atmosphere, right? Or you can feel somebody's joy it gets in the atmosphere, right? So, what's in can be pushed out. So, what, what Joseph does is he pushes out his gift. And the butler and the baker have dreams. But nobody can interpret it. He only pushes out his ability for them to dream. They have to come to him to get the what? Ready? Watch this. He pushes out his gift to influence a butler. What's a butler do? Open doors for you. <laughs> What's a baker do? A cupbearer. He's next to the king. He protects and helps the king. So one guy dies, the other guy lives, but eventually he pushes out his gift to the pharaoh. The Pharaoh has a dream, and then the guy who lives, when Pharaoh says, I had a dream, the guy who lives goes, oh, I know the guy who interprets it. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> Look at somebody say, you need a butler. Somebody to open up doors for you. Look at somebody say, you need a baker. Somebody who can pave the way for you. And look at somebody saying, you need a Pharaoh. And you need a Pharaoh. Somebody who's in a position of power to elevate you. And assist you. And assist you. In putting you. Into the place God wants you to be. Into the place God wants you to be. Amen. Okay, so this doesn't just happen in one sense of scripture. 
Daniel was a dreamer. Pharaoh has a dream. Here's a man who doesn't. See, this is the thing. Let me just mess with you. The butler and the baker didn't know God. But Joseph did. And his gift was so profound and powerful, he knew what to do with his gift until God spoke to somebody who didn't even know him. When Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about the future, at that time he didn't know God. Okay. All right, can I really mess with you? See, see right now you're going, hmm, I don't know about all that. <laughs> no problem. Did that, okay, everybody look at me. Did Daniel the prophet fast and pray? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Do we all agree he fasted and prayed? Yes. yes. Okay. Do you remember when he was one of the 120 leaders and the other 119 got jealous and they used prayer against him so he got thrown into the den of lions? Yes. Do you agree that Daniel fasted and prayed? Yes. yes. So then, the anointing, the anointing to fast and pray that was in Daniel got in his atmosphere. And the lions lost their appetite. That's good. That is good. That's it. And as soon as Daniel left the den and they threw the other guys in, the atmosphere changed. Oh no 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 no! See, I'm trying. See, your okay. You can influence the atmosphere. Yeah. Is my point. Yeah. Look at somebody say, you can crack the atmosphere. You can, crack you can, crack the atmosphere. You can change the atmosphere. You can, you, can the atmosphere. you can influence the atmosphere. You can influence the atmosphere. Am I making sense to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Now let me just go here a little further. And this is going to make you think. What if I told you that any atmosphere that you have encountered, you can memorize and you can store it? If you, your spirit has the ability to store the feeling of that atmosphere, so that when you encounter it again, you recognize it. <laughs> Say that again. Oh, yeah. yeah it really is, isn't it? No, it's really, okay, see, 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 this is what, okay. When you watch Billy Graham, Billy Graham releases through the anointing and atmosphere. The atmosphere is for people to get saved. That's the anointing he releases into the atmosphere. Everything about the service is to release an atmosphere of the anointing for salvation into the lives of sinners. Everything he does, it's a system. By the way, in his system, as soon as he gave an altar call, people would get up to come to the altar. And it wasn't people to get saved. It was workers. So when the sinners saw other people moving, they did not feel self-conscious about getting up to come to Jesus. It was a system. He made it easy for them to come to the Lord Jesus. If you went to a Catholic Kuhlman meeting back in the day, she only permitted certain kinds of songs. Songs that brought up the majesty of God, the glory of God, the name of God, the person of God. Because she's releasing what and who God was and is into the atmosphere. So, the concept is this. Worship is where God settles. Praise is where God moves. And then she would have the miraculous. Does that make sense? So, there's an atmosphere for salvation, there's an atmosphere for healing, 
The atmosphere for miracles is not the same as the atmosphere for healing. There's, a, there's, a, there's an atmosphere for prayer. There's an atmosphere for praise. There's an atmosphere for worship. There's an atmosphere for intercession. For deliverance. So once you experience an encountered atmosphere, you can learn atmosphere, and when God brings that atmosphere in, you know what he's getting ready to do. Yes, sir. What's the difference in the miracle atmosphere and the healing atmosphere? Totally different. Totally different feel. Um Typically speaking, um, you have to generally start with the atmosphere of healing to break into the realm of the miraculous. Unless that atmosphere has already been um, created where you are. So, um, see, what, okay. Um, when, if it's not there, you have to crack the atmosphere. And then you have to create it. So what a lot of people don't understand is that these things are created. Um, realm, super, okay, supernatural realms are created. You have to create it. And you create it by the thing, by the systems. The wisdom systems that God gives you. And so, um, that's what you do. So, for example, I know if I preach certain things, if I preach it long enough, it will start to manifest. It just will. Because I understand, I, I, have a, I have an understanding of certain systems. So if I preach something long enough, it will start to manifest. Because eventually, the words I speak will literally become a substance. And it will take on so much substance that it stops being invisible and becomes invisible. Amen. Okay? Amen. No, I'm telling you. I'm not telling you. I'm not giving you a theory. I'm telling you. I know. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I just know. So, uh, that was a great question. Um, next question. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> Um, what is the difference between, let's say there's an intercessor? Who enters, That's the difference between, let's say there's an intercessor. Who enters into their atmosphere by hearing a song that they have, that they thought they manifested the presence of the Lord in. And every time that song is played, they go right into it, but never change from that. They can't get... It's kind of like... Oh, okay, no, no, no. What she's saying is, saying. Yeah. is there's a song that takes a person into an intercession, but they never move from there. Okay, here's the thing. The scripture says uh, in 2 Corinthians that you're supposed to move from what? Glory to glory. And Psalm 84 talks about you're supposed to move from strength to strength. Romans 1 talks about you're supposed, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So you're talking about three different realms of the supernatural. You're talking about the realm of faith. Strength is the anointing. Glory is the glory realm. And so what happens is, is remember I talked about how people get stuck? That's it. They're stuck. They're stuck. Yeah. They're stuck. And so, um, so they need to work on getting on. See, here's the, here's the, here's the problem. Now, as soon as I say this, you'll recognize it. You ready? Here's what happens for, for most of us, not to all of us, but for most of us. You will hear a song, and the anointing will be all over that song. The glory of God will be all over that song. And in your spirit, you leave. <laughs> and for three months or six months, whenever you hear that song, and then about seven or eight months, it's not a tennis. <laughs> because the anointing and the glory on that song as it relates to you starts to delete. And you know what you do? You look for a what? A new song. Amen. It's by design. Sing unto the Lord a new song. 
So if it's new, it stays fresh. So what happens is this. We, we stay with the old, but the old is deleted. That's why, that's why, if you get in a routine, after a while, the routine will only take you so far. And then the life of God that was in that routine starts to delete. And now you gotta get a, everybody say, a new routine. A new routine. Same with like weightlifting, right? Same with eating. You have to change your eating to get, look at somebody say, you gotta change to get different results. It's, that, it's the same way. Next question. Are you getting something out of this? Are you enjoying this? Are you having fun? Okay, good. Next question. Different person. What about the, the deep childhood trauma a lot of people have everywhere on the streets and everywhere? How do you uh, get that person to see God differently? You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even I've had that. Huh? Even I've had that happen, and I'll go increase in so much stuff of God, and I'll still have that one thing as a child that just scratches my head. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, here's, okay, here's the thing. Um, you have to describe it in order to define it. Okay? And so, um, Trauma, by its very nature. Uh, this is interesting. Um, if, you, if, if you look, well, this is a whole subject. I can't answer it in five minutes. That's okay. No, 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 but I am going to speak to it. Because um, as with everything, there's different components to it. But with trauma, this is interesting. In your scripture, your Matthew 4, 23, 24, where it says that Jesus taught in their synagogues and preached the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Right? Right? And then it goes on to say, and he healed every kind of sickness and every kind of disease among the people. Remember that it says that? And then it says um, he healed various diseases. And then it says he healed pains. You want to know what's crazy? The Greek word for pains is where we get trauma. Okay? So there's a gift of healing for trauma. Now usually when you're dealing with trauma, um, you have, boy this is so involved, but uh, let me give you a, um, a capsule comment. Um, I sort of kind of wrote a book on this subject. Um, there are five different words for healing. I will mention two. Usually when you're dealing with trauma, you're dealing with a Greek word of healing that's called yeomai. And yeomai um, is a gradual progressive healing that happens over time. Um, and you see this, actually, some of the, sometimes when you see Jesus heal somebody, it was Yeomai, it was not instantaneous. It was not immediate. When you're looking at instantaneous or immediate healing, you're looking at therapeo. Although, there are cases where Jesus will do a therapeo, um, instantaneous healing of trauma. Usually those are like extremely dramatic. Like we know a guy by the name of Paul, who was a drug addict, Jesus appears to him and says, I didn't call you to be a drug addict. I called you to be a prophet. And he was instantly delivered. Amen. Okay? Uh, there was a guy. Um, he was mentally retarded. And the power of God hits him and instantly his brain is restored. And I think he got like five masters. I mean, it's just, you know what I mean? And then you have somebody else who they have to work their way through trauma for weeks or for months. And you know, you may have some cases where it lasts even longer than that. Um, the thing of it is, is if it's not gonna be instantaneous, usually you're gonna need a counselor. 
somebody who knows what they're doing, who can help you work your way through the process of healing, and usually there's some deliverance associated with that. Um, I have a good friend of mine who kind of specializes in trauma. Her name is Katie Souza. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody here heard of Katie? Yes. Okay. yes. Katie's yes. a very good friend of mine. <laughs> she was an enforcer. Um, that means that she did collections. That means you owe me drugs, and I'm pretty much, you will give me my money. So she was nuts. She was getting ready to rob a bank just to see if she could do it before it. She was supposed to do 13 years. She ended up doing five. So she does a thing called Keys to the Miraculous Healing of the Soul. And so um, sometimes a person's trauma is some, the reason they struggle with it is they don't even know the reason for the trauma. Because you, your mother could have had trauma and you were in their belly and you're born with the trauma. And you go, why do I have this issue? That makes sense to you. Oh, yeah. So usually, um, this is an area of the soul that has to be identified. Sometimes something has to be revealed that will bring you to freedom and deliverance. Okay, and there are ministers who really have that. That's their thing. Okay, great question. Um, it's very involved. I'm trying to think of this guy's name. Um, Dr. Michael. There's a guy um, who works with, oh, come on. There's a guy's name, he, he works with Randy Clark. Uh, it's not, his name is Michael. I used to know him. I can't think of his last name. But he has a thing on post-traumatic stress syndrome. Oh, yeah, Michael God. He's got a good little... Michael... The guy's name, he's so awesome. He's a heavyset guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think he's got a, I can't think of his last name. I haven't seen him in a long time. And matter of fact, so I, I think he teaches at Randy Clark School. Um, did, did you listen to his stuff on trauma? Yeah, he, he's got some of the best stuff. Uh, you know, the top which was uh, a few months ago, it's just. Yeah. yeah. He's got some of the best, I think. Yes. And then there's a um there's a guy by the name of Nelson. Nelson. In Saginaw. In Saginaw. Who um who's also I think he was a psych uh, a, a psychologist. Um and uh obviously say filled with the Holy Spirit. He does he has a stuff on trauma. Michael Miller? Huh? Miller? Michael Miller? I don't know. I do know, uh, no, you know, you're talking about with, with, uh, with Randy Clark? Mm -hmm. No, if you say his last name, I'll, I'll have it. Okay. I, all I gotta do is just hear his last name. I just can't think of it, because I haven't seen him in okay. about eight years, nine years now, I think. Um, but yeah, there's a guy who's, um, his name is Nelson, and he is, he knows this stuff. Next question. We're going to come to a close. How late is it getting to be? 9.16. Okay. Okay. That's not bad. Is it Michael Cuyamas? No. Not Michael. <laughs> <laughs> not Michael Cuyamas. That's, that's, that's <laughs> Benny Hinn's son of mine. Michael Diaz. Huh? Michael Diaz? No. No. Who my Michael Jackson? No. <laughs> he needed healing. <laughs> <laughs> you need a lot of deliverance. Yes. <coughs> That's a whole other story. <laughs> it's an interesting story, a fascinating story. Mike Hutchinson. Mike Hutchinson. Hutchinson. That's right. Yeah, Mike Hutchins or Mike Hutchinson. It's one of those two, right? Yeah, he's a Mike great guy. Huh? Hutchings. Hutchings. That's right. That's him. Wow, I haven't seen him in nine years. Okay, that, that helped me. Because it was going to bug me. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> okay, any, any, any other questions before we move forward? Yes, ma'am. Uh, talking about um, mental and... Uh, uh, I have a son 
He's 90 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, he behaves like a three years old. Mm -hmm. He got diagnostic autistic at four years old. Yes. Um, and he keeps on saying that about something about 2005. He write it down. He's fascinated with 2005. Mm -hmm. He likes stuff from 2005. And I pray and I fast many times and ask God, God, what happened when he was three years old? And the only thing that I remember, he got the, the, um, the vaccine of um, MMRI. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there's a... So I don't let me, no, no, let that. me, no, let me, because I'm not going to go into this. There is, a, there's a direct correlation between a particular vaccine and autism. The numbers are way, way too high. It's like he stopped there. But the that day, um, I, I pray one thing, and I had this vision. I was in a conference of Mike and Sherry Taylor. They were both was with Randy Clark for a few years. Yes. And, uh, and so I had this vision. And for me, it was a revelation. And for some, some, some time, sorry, my English is not good. I it's think you're doing well. I understand. <laughs> and for some certain time it was good. I was used that vision, particular vision of Jesus and his uh, crown of thorn, thorns, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. And um, I saw he was telling me, he wasn't speaking, but it was like in No, I know. Mind. It's spirit to spirit. And I yeah. saw his face, all the form and the crown was so deep <coughs> and I, and then he was saying, he was pointing and in his eyes, I, 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 I heard through his eyes, his lips wasn't moving, and his finger was like pointing to the thorn. Yeah. And he was saying, I spoke upon me, autism, thou syndrome. And he started saying everything that has to do with the mind. Yes. I kept that in my heart. I cried the whole conference. And I, the whole the next two days of the conference, I keep seeing his face pointing the whole <laughs> Day to day. Yeah. Uh, I start praying for my son yes. with that revelation. Yes. Put my hands on his head. At right. that time, he wasn't speaking well. He wasn't doing many things that the doctor said. He never do this. He never do that. Yeah. After that revelation, I start saying, and, and I saw things happen, but I got, like you say, it stopped. Yeah, okay, here's the deal. I felt like I got stuck with Okay, that. here's the deal. Um, what color did... I don't know if you paid attention. What color did Jesus, was, was his hair? His head, for me, it was kind of black, but it has like a it was kind of, gold, like an oil gold yeah. or something. Yeah, but you, you saw but him in his suffering. So bloody, warm. Yeah, but you saw him in his suffering, right? Yes. Okay, so um, what color was his skin? Could you tell? Oh, I think it was like mine. It yeah, it's very similar to yours. I, I met Jesus. First time I met him was in heaven in 1989. Oh, yeah. You talk about John, I'm sorry to change. You say, and I see a picture in front of me from when I was um, 26 years old. He gave me a vision because he tried to heal me from a trauma when I was 30 years old. I saw him on his back. When my father abandoned us, I was, I'm the second, we have five kids. I was 30 years old and my father left in the middle of the night. Nurse. She was working at night shift window. He's abandoned us, and um, and at that moment I start have an asthma, the spirit of rejection or something got into me. I start have problem with breathing. At 26 years old, I was praying for something else for my family salvation, and Jesus took me to that moment. Say today I want to heal you from rejection, and I didn't know Jesus was the one to remember that. I had nothing to do. I'm praying right now. I want to heal you. So you know how he healed me? I saw Jesus, he, oh, the back of Jesus. He put his hand on my back. I saw me at 30 years old looking through a window. Okay? My father was abandoned us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to share this. I'm sorry for taking time. Well, I just feel fine. like I have to share this. You know, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I have two children. No, 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 no. You are the only one who's seen Jesus through a window. Yeah, so, so. Amen. I saw him, I saw myself at 30 years old, okay, and, uh, and I saw him putting his hand on my back, and uh, he, he was shiny, everything, his hair was long, and it was this, this golden thing in his hair. The glory. Yeah, it was, it was awesome, 
And he was saying, Angelica, if your father and your mother abandon you, I'll never, if I'll never forsake you, I'll never abandon you. You know that's a scripture, right? And I wasn't Christian. Did you know that was a scripture? <laughs> yes, but at the time, I became a Christian at tw 22 years old. Yes. At 26 years old, he healed me from that trauma. Yes. And that moment in my closet, prayer closet, I was praying, I started crying, crying, and I said, I forgive my father. I yes. forgive my father. And, well, and I felt the power of God. I started drawing up and started to share, but with white stuff, gooey. It's, yeah, you got oh, it's that awesome. <laughs> After that, I was able to go to Brazil with my kids for my father to meet my, my, my children. After yes. Years. So... That's the only two times that I can say, like I said, oh, Okay, so here's, here's what you do. Um, how's your son doing now? Well, I'm planning to bring them to, I have twins. Yes. They're both has diagnosed as autistic, but one is more severe. You gonna bring them tomorrow night? Yes. Okay. And Matthew, you were saying something about depression. Yeah. And that's what I feel my son carries. The okay, other here's the deal. I'm gonna tell you this quick story. I was in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this banker came and uh, he put me in the best room at this hotel. I can't remember how much it cost, 3000 a night. He didn't have to do that. I think, I, I think he spent like $12,000 on it. And he had an autistic child. It was his faith. He's a good, he's a good guy. We're still friends to this day. And this was quite a few years ago. And um, prayed for his child. Jesus healed his child. And so we've we've seen Jesus heal autism. I believe. I believe. Yeah, we've seen some, you know, we've seen some railroad miracles. I mean like like um, um, this 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 one child had holes in the brain. Um the mother was told the child would never talk, never walk. The child would be a vegetable. The child wouldn't be able to function. I can't remember everything. They had a disease that I can't always say. And Jesus healed the child. Um, holes in the brain healed, filled. I mean, it was just, you know what I mean? We had another case of um, a child that wasn't supposed to be able to talk, wasn't supposed to be able to walk. I mean, the whole nine yards in California. That one happened in Missouri. This one uh, that I'm telling you right now happened in California. Uh, totally healed by Jesus. And so, um, yeah, so yeah, brain. That revelation, that, I, that vision that I saw, like I said, I felt like I got stuck. Stuck. Pray for him. And here's, the here's, the here's, words was coming no, here's, here's the thing. Most of the time with regards to the miraculous, we want to see instantaneous results. Mm -hmm. And that's great, I love to see that. We see that a lot, if I go there. But sometimes, okay, we have a housekeeper. We have, we have more than one housekeeper, but one of the housekeepers, her name is Michelle. Didn't know the Lord, I led her to the Lord. She had cancer, she was expecting to die. She also had a growth. She had um, surgery for the growth. I prayed for her, pain went away, and then it came back a little bit, but not like it was before. So we didn't see her for a while. And then all of a sudden, she shows up again. And this is what she said. She said, I had surgery, they removed the growth. And she had the cancer, right? Well, the doctor examines her and says, I know there was cancer here, but it's gone. This was like weeks later, weeks later. Now she's back working for us again. But it didn't happen. And we've had it happen, but it didn't. So the big thing is, is you have to believe that it's done the moment you pray. And then let, um, here's the thing, you ready? You have facts and you have truth. Facts change all the time. But the truth is, by his stripes, you will heal. So what happens is, is if you believe the truth, the facts conform to the truth. Amen. So the child could be healed. Amen. Okay. All right. One more question, and then we're gonna. I'm gonna let you get. I'm gonna let you go. You got a question? 
Oh, okay. You were saying, let us go. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I follow you. Question. Anybody else who hasn't asked the question first? But if not, come on, you. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, do you have somebody who's in a church and they're so faithful, they're stuck. You talked about being stuck. Yeah. Okay? They're so faithful to that church, but there's no praying in tongues. There's none of, none of the gifts flowing in the church. They want to leave, but they can't because of being faithful to the man of God. I understand that. But they want more, but they're just stuck. How do you pray for someone like that besides, you know, Lord touch them? Um, I would pray for them in the Holy Spirit. Besides, yeah. That's what I would do. Because you're praying the perfect prayer. And I, I would ask the Lord, say, Lord, um, design for me a prayer through the Holy Spirit that will get this person free. Because, you know, you're looking at they just need to be set free from a captivity. Whether that's a religious spirit or um, a soul tire or whatever we want to call that, okay? Um, you know, sometimes we get comfortable. And sometimes we don't like change. Does that make sense to you? Okay. All right. Well, stand to your feet. I hope you got something out of this. I, I believe, you know. How many of you enjoyed the word? Amen. Amen. Okay, very good. I'm sure tomorrow night we'll do we'll do personal ministry, <clears throat> but uh, you know it is Sunday night. I don't want to hold you too late on a Sunday night, but tomorrow we're gonna we're gonna go for it. Amen. So bow your heads, Holy Father. I thank you for your Holy Word. I ask that your Holy Spirit would um, take the Word and remind people of the Word. And Lord, let people be free, let people grow, let people be unstuck, let people progress, let people finish. Lord, Paul said, I finished my course, I kept the faith. So Lord, help people to finish. Lord, help people to grow. And Lord, I give you praise for it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 I'm turning it over to Pastor. I just want to say thank you, Father. Thank you for the man of God. Thank you for the apostle and prophet that you have brought forth. I thank you for connections. I thank you, Father, for divine appointments. I thank you, Father, Lord, for these are the seasons and times. And Father, I just thank you that right now you are going to speak to each and every one of these people.
So I'm going to hold forth this basket and I'm going to pass it around. And those who have cash, they can put that right on top. <coughs> Everything that we take is going directly to Tony. So take this moment, take this time, and we're just going to give on to our Father the offering. And it will be divine. And I do know what it says in the Word. It does say, when you give on to a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. So I just say, receive your prophet's reward. Those who are, as they're being passed, for those who are coming back on on Facebook. Oh yes, Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> Facebook. Those who have been on Facebook, who are wanting to give, who have had and, and received. Um, do you have? What can we give? Those are the, and if you needed to hear that again, <coughs> I'm going to put you back on the spot. <laughs> A little slower now. Sorry. PayPal or Cash App. You can find us by our email address. It's AEM for the heart all together at gmail.com. And all that that comes in on those, it will go directly on to Tony. So I ask right now, Father, has everyone been able to bless Prophet? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Father, we're just going to lift up our hands. I'm going to stretch my hands to this offering. And I just thank you, Father. I give you praise for that which you have brought forth. And I ask, Lord, that you would bring forth, Father, the rewards of the people. Father, the rewards that you said that we would receive a prophet's reward. And I thank you, believing and trusting that all things, all things will be brought and added unto them. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, so at this time, I know that um, Prophet Tony is going to be here tomorrow, and I know that he is going to be doing a lot of prophetically praying over people and prophesying. Um, he has had a long morning and a long night, and so we want to respectfully get him into the places where um, he can get recovery and, and be fed and be able to rest. So, um, Tony? Yes. You're more than welcome to Lizette. Let's see, Lizette's back here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the people? Good night. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be wonderful hosts. <laughs> We're going to be wonderful hosts, and then we're going to be teaching, and, and, and we protect the people. <laughs>